for a lot of people, struggle with feeling that they're even able to accept love. Because they feel like they're not worthy. They don't deserve it. Newsflash. None of us do. The Lord gives it to us by his grace. That is some good, good news. So we've been talking through this sermon series. If you are new today, hopefully this will all make perfect sense to you. But we've been on this journey through the book of Acts. Talking about this idea of what does it take to activate our faith. To go from a place of fear to a place of following. Because fear gets in the way of the best things in our lives. I uh, heard a quote this week that said, fear is a thief. Fear steals the best things in your life. So how, when it comes to our faith, do we make sure that fear doesn't steal the best thing in our life, and that's our relationship with God? How do we do that? What does that look like? How do we even start to get our heads around it all? When we started this series way back when, I was like, I was in January. Hope you guys aren't sick of it yet. I mean, just hang in there, right? We'll go through this month, we'll finish the book of Acts, and then we'll be to Easter. So uh, when we first started, I started with a story, uh, a parable, if you will, about a guy in the desert, walking in the desert, comes upon this oasis, there's this shack there, and there's what, what seems to be a, a water pump, and he goes, he finds a bottle of water, he's about to drink it, realizes there's instructions that say, use this to start the pump. And he's so thirsty, he doesn't know what to do. Do I just do the thing that would satisfy my immediate need and drink the water? Or do I trust that these instructions are going to work and use it to start the pump? And I said, it's kind of like how we live our lives a little bit. Am I going to do the thing that just suits my immediate needs? Or am I going to follow the instructions of you? Am I going to listen to what God, want, God wants for my life and act accordingly? And we have to think that whatever thing he has for us is better than whatever thing we have for ourselves. But what is it that compels us to follow the instructions? What is that? What makes us trust in God's plan over our plan? That's what we're talking about today. In the leadership world, in the business world, you've probably heard a lot about this. In the self-help world, you hear a lot about this, and that is mindset. Well, it's all about your mindset. Got to have the right mindset, which is helpful to a point. So let's talk a bit about mindset. Mindset, as defined by Dr. Jacob Towery, uh, Department of Psychiatry from Stanford, says mindsets are a set of assumptions that help you distill complex worldviews into digestible information and then set expectations based on this input. And the idea is, if your mindset isn't doing you any favors, you can always change your mindset. And one of the most dramatic examples of this that I've seen in history is something you've probably heard before or maybe even heard it in, through your business, because I know they use this a lot, and that is, Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile. First person to ever break the four-minute mile. Now, uh, Sir Roger Bannister passed away in 2018. Uh, but it was believed that it was physically impossible to run a sub-four-minute mile. In fact, back in this day, in, in that time, there were all these studies from medical journals saying it was physically impossible for the human body to run that fast. It was a goal that they'd been chasing since the late 1800s. And there was a world, world record of 4 minutes, 1.3 seconds, I think, that stood for nine years. I mean, it was, it was a mindset thing. Here's, here's why. Because when Roger Bannister broke it, it's crazy. So he broke it May 6, 1954, at 3 minutes, 59 seconds, 59.4 seconds. Now, all of that from the 1800s where they were really trying to break the four-minute mile, being told you can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And then for nine years, this record sticks of 4.01.3. How long do you think it took for Bannister's record to be broken? 46 days. What changed? 
all of a sudden people believed, oh wait, it is possible. And they started breaking that record. It's such a dramatic and I think great example of mindset. What's that, what's that old saying? Those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right. It's mindset. But of course, it's more than just this kind of motivational self-help idea. There's a biblical idea of mindset, of renewing your mind in Christ, of what the Holy Spirit does inside of you that changes the way you see your life in front of you, the world around you, the things that matter most. It's all through a renewing of your mind. So, what is it that compels us to follow the instructions? A changed mindset, but spiritually, it doesn't happen on our own. So it's not like, I'm going to change my mind about whether or not I could succeed at business, or this, or I'm going to meet this, like, health goal or something. A spiritual version of this depends 100% on the Holy Spirit. In other words, you don't just study your way into having the mind of Christ. It actually begins with the heart that then changes the mind. Here's uh, how scripture says it about this idea of the spirit renewing our minds. It said, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Cool, to the next. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them. Because they are discerned only through the Spirit. But we have the mind of Christ. We who have put our faith in Christ have the mind of Christ. So what is that really saying? It's saying that a renewed mind begins with a transformed heart. Faith. A change of heart. Think about it. I mean, in the basic level, that's faith. It's saying, I'm now putting my heart, everything I am, everything I believe, into trusting in Jesus. And scripture's full of these wonderful, um, you know, analogies. And like, I will transform this heart of stone into a heart of flesh. I will give you a new heart. We even hear the song that they do in the warm-up sometimes, created me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a right spirit within me. This heart transformation is something that happens when you put your faith in Jesus. And, and you won't just get there with the renewing of your mind without it. I'll give you an example. I know lots of people, none in this church, lots of people have been coming to church their whole life and don't have a transformed heart. How do I know? Because it has byproducts. You see it spill out. You could know everything there is to know about Jesus and still not know Jesus. You get what I'm saying? You could talk about God, but not ever talk to God. It starts with a heart transformation saying, God, I am a sinner in need of saving. I need you to rescue me. I need your forgiveness and your grace. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Heart transformation. And then we get this thing that they're calling the mind of Christ, which is sort of wild. Uh, Second Peter says it this way, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Participate in the divine nature. That's wild. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Or my favorite, Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
We read scriptures like that, we read them really fast, but I don't think we realize the promise that's in there. Have you ever wondered what God wants for you in your life? Or what God wants you to do next? This is like the most common thing that I hear. Pastor, I don't know what God wants me to do. I wish God would just show me. I wish God would, guess what? He will. It's not meant to be some sort of, se- God's not like playing a sick joke. Try to find your destiny. Good luck. <laughs> I'm going to give you all these fake ones. And, like, that's not what God wants. God wants you to know what he wants you to know. It's whether or not we're listening. If you have a renewed mind, changed heart, renewed mind, you're going to start to perceive what it is that God has for you. You don't get there otherwise. Otherwise, it looks like foolishness, as the scripture says. It just doesn't compute. A wonderful leadership book for those in leadership, I think you would like this, called Work, A Work of Heart by Reggie McNeil. He talks about the heart shaping that God does, the necessary heart shaping God does for leadership. And the conclusion of the book really is a changed mindset is fueled by a change of heart. An activated faith begins from the heart level and then to the mind and then to the hands and feet. He says this, many people unaware or unwilling to face the holes in their own heart wreck their lives trying to plug the gap with more work, more attention, more power, more whatever. God desires to fill the spaces with himself. This is how we get a transformed heart, a changed heart, a God-shaped heart. Let God in to fill the gaps. Don't feel like, oh yeah, you know, if I get into that right college, if I get into that grad school, if I get that job, if I move to that city, if I get that new car, if we get that house we want, it's going to fill all the gaps. And what do we find? You know the answer. We get there and we're like, yeah, that didn't do, that didn't do it. I get work for a day, maybe even a week. But it didn't do it. Why? It only happens by letting God in to fill the gaps. Heart shaping leads to a spiritual mindset change, which leads to a transformed life. I love this illustration. This came from a, a website, so you know it's true. <laughs> I don't know, I was, I was kind of surfing and I came upon it from a website called compellingtruth.com. I hope they're not crazy, but I thought this was an interesting idea said, the human mind is like a computer and the Holy Spirit like an antivirus software. Just hold on, all right? Just, just go with it for a second. Once the program is uploaded, that mind can then affect all the computer systems, taking out harmful applications and replacing them with good functional applications. Continuing the analogy, the mind of Christ rewrites our hard drives so that we are capable of understanding or interfacing with God himself. Or if you like this one better, some of you, I think you're really into Bill Parcells. No, I'm getting no. Okay. So there's this thing in the NFL where they go to hire coaches and they say something like, oh, Billy over here is from the Bill Parcells coaching tree or from the Buddy Ryan coaching tree or, you know, whoever. What does that mean? It means that these coaches who worked with the actual legend, like Bill Parcells, they adopted their philosophies and their strategies and their understanding of football, how to coach up men, how to do all of these things. So when you hire them, it's like you're hiring Bill Parcells in a way. They share the same mind of football so you know what you're hiring. I don't think it's all that different from being a Christian. We should show Christ We should have the mind of Christ. We believe in the same philosophies and strategies and things that matter most. And we should be replicas of Jesus in our everyday life. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ, in my opinion. It's the way we filter the world and everything in it. Our purpose and how we're going to allow God to direct our steps. I want to show you an example of this. 
I think it helps to see examples. And thankfully, God gave us a whole bunch in our scriptures. One is the story we, we've been tracking with, with Saul's story, Saul who became Paul and had this big life transformation. I want to show you in real time, if you will, through the scripture, what the mind of Christ looks like in action. So you remember Saul's story? Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He was a Pharisee. He took it upon himself to round up Christians. He didn't, he didn't like what they had to say. He approved of them stoning Stephen to death. He was not pro-Christian. He has this life-transforming experience. God literally knocks him off his high horse. He hears Jesus' voice, transforms his life. And remember the vision that he gave to this guy in Damascus named Ananias. He was supposed to go lay hands on Paul, the persecutor of Christians, which that's a wild faith story right there. He uh, hears God say to him in this vision, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. That's a big leap from persecutor of Christians to then fulfilling this destiny from God about being his chosen instrument. And how did it happen? How does it happen with any of us? Well, I love the legend of Michelangelo and his statue of David. He was asked how he made this beautiful statue. He said, I just chipped away the parts of the marble that weren't David. I wonder if that's a little bit like what happens to us spiritually. When we come to Jesus and we have a heart transformation, the rest of our lives is like God chipping away the marble so that we become the people we were created to be. One perhaps painful piece at a time, but in the end it's revealing this beauty, this wonder of God's artwork that is our lives. So there's a, a, a moment when Paul then steps into, he's like commissioned to start fulfilling his actual purpose. We're going to read it very quickly. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And this began the great fulfillment of Paul's life, his journey across the ancient Mediterranean world. Uh, he went on four journeys, and he was planting churches everywhere he went, and then he would go back and he would, he would help give them whatever support that they needed. Paul literally changed the map by stepping into that purpose God created him to live. And there's this one story that I think shows what having the mind of Christ looks like, and how you know it's the mind of Christ and not Paul's mind. Here's what I mean. This is Acts chapter 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future, which there's a whole, like, sermon in that. that spiritual forces are real. That stuff does exist. However, it may not be the best thing for you. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed, which I love, I love that. I love that. I'm like, okay, there's hope for me. Paul, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. By advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. 
When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Here are some examples of how I think Paul shows the mind of Christ in this completely life-transformed way. He's not the same dude that he was before. And here's how I know this. How would you be feeling if you were in his place? Like, I just cast out this spirit from this lady, and then I get beaten and flogged severely, and I'm in the stocks in the inner cell. How would you be feeling? I don't know. I would love to say that I would respond great, but I think it might be a little like, you maybe hear your mom's voice a little, that's the thanks I get? I'm doing it. I'm doing the thing that you called me to do. This is the thanks I get, but watch this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. That, to me, is a sign of a renewed mind, the mind of Christ. What would make you sing in the face of suffering? A transformed heart, a renewed mind, something that you're seeing things in a completely different way. Not that you're ignoring pain or trying to pretend it's not there. It's that through the pain, you're still listening still receiving, still giving glory. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And what had you been thinking? Yeah! <laughs> like, that's what I'm talking about. I don't know, is that just me? I, I would be, yeah, later. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Why? Because it was his, they would have taken his life. The Roman authorities would have killed him for letting the prisoners escape. Even though, yes, no, he didn't control the earthquake. It, that wouldn't have mattered. But watch what happens. Talk about renewed mind. Watch what happens next. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. What? We're all here. What on earth would have made him stay? All those prisoners, what would have made them stay? The mind, the mind of Christ. I don't know what else would do it. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Ah, uh, he knew it. He knew it. This doesn't make any earthly sense. This is foolishness to those who don't have the Spirit. They replied, Believe in the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Clearly, God had other plans for this jailer. And only by being connected, understanding the mind of Christ, allowing the Spirit to lead you, made that happen. When we have the mind of Christ, it brings joy not just to us, but to others. That's the whole reason we're called to do what we're doing. Not just for us to enjoy, not just so that we have this very nice private faith but so that we let that faith impact the world around us, the people that we interact with, our jobs, our kids, our culture. So how does God do this? What are the ways that God shapes the heart 
to renew the mind. Here's a couple of things to pay attention to. The first is, God uses our environment. He uses your past, and he uses your present. All these things that have made you, you. All the great stuff, all the horrible stuff, has. if you allow God to do it, he will redeem all of it for his purposes. There is no such thing as needless suffering that you've gone through. God will give that suffering purpose. He will redeem it all as he's shaping your heart to reflect his glory. I think it also reminds us, you know, like Paul, and he had this transformation, and he's being transformed by the Holy Spirit. I think for us, though, it's a reminder that the environment we choose to be in has an impact on how God's shaping our heart. You tell this to kids all the time, right? Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Same deal. We need the same message. Our environments matter. They shape us. Are we making sure that we're intentional about our environment in such a way that we're being fed in our faith? I don't just mean coming to church. I mean, who are the people we're surrounding ourselves with? You ever get to a point when um, you kind of wake up and you realize, oh my gosh, I got all these negative people in my life. Like, they're dragging me down. I got to make a change. Not that you just write them off, but like, maybe I want to also spend some time with some other people. I'll be no good to them if I'm not being filled. Maybe I need to join a small group. Maybe I need to go do some mission work. Environment shapes our heart. Here's the second, encounter. The environment really doesn't matter if we're not willing to have an encounter with Jesus Christ, just as Paul did on the road to Damascus. An encounter with Jesus is not the same thing as his presence, right? It's not just his teachings, excuse me. It's his presence. How do we have a regular encounter with Jesus to change our hearts, renew our minds? That's huge. We need it all the time. We need this constant reset. Like a machine that's just a little bit off, we need a recalibration all the time, every day. It's not hard, but it does take discipline. Like, hey, I'm going to spend a little time and pray today. I'm going to read this devotional. Or if you're just a television person, I'm going to watch The Chosen and I'm going to reflect on Jesus. I don't know. Get creative. How can you be intentional? about an encounter with the presence of Jesus. It's not just knowing about Jesus, it's knowing Jesus. And then lastly, we trust in the Holy Spirit to empower us to do it, to fill the gaps with him. The Spirit will give you the mind of Christ and the ability to follow accordingly. Here's the thing, heart shaping leads to a spiritual mindset change which leads to a transformed life which leads to joy for you and for others. What about you this morning? I think some things to listen to in your life is if you're still experiencing some sort of fear or anxiety that seems to always block you from what you think God wants you to do, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. Those are the things that stop you from fully receiving what God wants to give you. Remember, it's not a trick. God wants you to know what you're supposed to do. He wants you to know his will. And I think all of this sort of comes together in that ancient creed that they used to say as children, as Jewish children, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind all your strength. Maybe God wants to do with you like Michelangelo on that statue. I just chipped away the parts of the marble that weren't you to reveal this glorious creation he has created you to be. When you start doing this, I promise you this, it will activate your faith. Amen.